Take it away. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Dane. I'm a 3D art person at Grinding Gear Games. Uh, I do a little bit more than that. Um, I got my fingers in a few different pies. I kind of know a bit about rigging and animation and uh, come from a graphic design background, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bit particular about the 2D part of the item art, as, despite being a 3D guy. Um, so I'm going to get into the, the art aspect of POE 2's items, and I'm going to pass it over to Hrishi afterwards to talk about the, the wonderful numbers stuff you guys love so much. All right, so art in our game is, you know, for items, is in two different sort of fields of what we refer to as the 3D art, which is what you see in your character, obviously, and the 2D art, which is, I think, is actually the most important part. And I say this as a guy that spends a lot of time modeling this stuff. Uh, the 2D art is the part that you're, you're picturing in your, in your head. It's the part that is, is just, it's the icon. It's iconic, you know? Um, all the way back to the 90s, like when I was a kid playing Diablo 1, you didn't see it on your character, you just, you, you, the inventory was where you saw it, so it was the most important thing. So you'd look at this little icon of like Gr uh, Griswold's Edge or the Butcher's Cleaver, and you'd be like, oh, that's so cool, oh, does fire damage, wow. <laughs> but um, for Peewee, uh, for Peewee 1, uh, obviously you see your 2D art on your 3D model, but even to this day, there's still some uniques that don't have any 3D art, which is a bit of a fail. Um, that's not going to happen anymore. <laughs> POE 2, the 2D art always comes from the 3D art because we render it out at high quality. Um, in the past, the 2D art was a bit of a mishmash of all sorts of stuff. Um, this is random stuff that I've grabbed from the icons folder. Some of it looks like a 3D model, it's like A-posed. Some of it's like a photo, just a straight up photo. Some of it's like super cartoony, like this guy down here. It, it ends up with a very inconsistent um, kind of front end to the game. Like, you guys are used to it. You play the game so many years and items get added over time that it doesn't really matter. But it was always a bit of a problem to me that things look inconsistent it's because Different artists have different approaches to how they just paint and render and do things, and sometimes they'll be like, we need a unique um, yesterday. So someone will just <laughs> just get a photo of a shield, I guess. And um, <laughs> um, so POE2, um, these aren't the same items as the previous screen, so don't freak out that Calm's heart now looks like that, because um, that's not it. Um, this is just an example of similar size stuff. Um, basically, every single item, whether even if it's a small thing, gets through the full treatment. Uh, I was modeling little gum nuts for that little potion bottle right there just to render it. Um, the flasks are all redone in 3D. Everything's redone in 3D. Um, and the goal is that you get a consistent image on all the items. So everything in your inventory, everything in your stash, it's going to look clean and like it came from the same place because the, the rendering is like the great equalizer. It doesn't, doesn't paint a certain way on this side or, or whatever. So everything's going to be clean. So this is an example of some shields. Uh, top is dex, bottom is strength dex. And we call those obviously bucklers. Um, and these ones we're calling a taj, or ju I just call them a shield because they're kind of like the standard, just a shield. These things always highlighted a problem with me in the game, because I'm a visual person, and I'd glance at stuff and I'd go, what is that? It's round and it's a shield, and I'd be like, I'd have to like think a bit. For people that play the game all the time, you get that vocabulary, you know what it is, you've played it a million times, you've seen all these items, but I think for a brand new game, it's even more important to really get things nice and clear, so what I'm doing with all the the main primary stat shields is they all point that way, and the split ones go that way. Um, for stuff like this where they're all round, I think it's really important because, again, as soon as it drops, A, the name, it's always going to be something buckler or a Taj, and you'll just know, okay, that's a thing, that's, a, that's dex. And it's, it's sitting in your inventory, you, just, you don't even have to like, you just glance at it and you'll just, you'll just know. 
Same thing with uh, like axes is a good example because axes to me always look like they can be two-handed or one-handed, and they're kind of frustrating to look at. Um, again, I've chosen to make the one hand that's go this way, two hands that way. Um, it's like a small thing, trying it out, it might <laughs> get rolled back later. They might all end up facing the same way. Um, I personally like it. Um, just a few base types from the axe. This isn't, this isn't by means all of them, this is just some of them. Um, like I said, even the small stuff gets the same treatment. So we've got some amulets and these three, I'll let you figure out what they might do. Um, <laughs> Um, but yeah, they go through the same treatment. We have a lot of control because they're 3D rendered. We can try and you know, just play around with what they are. And it's very hard to get an artist to say, oh, I think I want the sword this way and painted like that. And they go, well, I just have to repaint the whole thing then, I guess, which they don't. <laughs> Currency orbs, same thing. And uh, these were a fun one because we got to redesign what, what we thought of them as. Um, previous uh, head honcho Eric, who's, who's now retired. Um, he was, this was his little baby. He's actually printed massive scale cast bronze of these things. Uh, he's got a huge exalted orb that's like this big. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was mostly just to get them to be more cohesive. So they've got that same kind of, uh, that Roman kind of bust head thing going on with a lot of them. Um, yeah, and so they all, they all get the same treatment, even if they're a little, little guy. Some armors, so these are the base types. First six for the different uh, character branches. So I don't know if you're able to tell, but there is a gradient that occurs here. So it goes from dex, dex int, int, int strength, strength dex, Oh, sorry, strength, and then strength dex. And it kind of loops around where you, the strength dex looks a little lighter, and it kind of, um, that's a personal thing as well, just trying to get things to be very clearly gradiented across the items so that it feels like you, you can just glance at stuff and just know what it is. And this comes into the naming of things, which is also, a, 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 you know, as a visual person, it's another thing. It, it actually had an impact on the art in a cool way as well. So every single dex base type armor will be something vest or something coat. And same with all these, they're, go, they're all gonna be called that. And you might go, oh, that's kind of limiting. But that limitation actually kind of breeds really interesting creativity to actually accentuate the more. And like I said, you get a cool gradient that happens as you go from through the stats and it loops back around. Um, yeah, so everything's strength will just look m massive. Um, like, um, what's the unique, the bronze one with the massive? Uh, bra uh, yeah, brass dome? Yeah, brass dome. Th there's a base type that just is that big, you know what I mean? Like, same, same thing with all the items. The pet peeve is when you're working on all these things, so many things get called boots, helmet, gauntlets, and after a while, it just from the art managing side, it got, I got really annoyed. I was just like, Where, what is this again? And so it was like affecting the management part as well as me just reading stuff in the game as well. So they're all gonna be basically partitioned in a way, naming-wise, that affects the art a little bit. It's not as strict as you would think. Like, say, if I go, I'll let you look at that for a little bit like say the gauntlets, right? They've got like, these ones here have got a bit of a leather bracer aspect that kind of starts transitioning over to what the dex ones do, which will be only focused more on this area. And they kind of spread out, and so there's more, more uh, just, just more identity between them. Every, like, here's, a, here's a good example actually versus Pee Wee One, because I think the dex int gloves are called the mittens, right? Mm. Yep. And that always bothered me because a mitten style like gauntlet is actually a thing. And it's a very strong, strengthy, bulky looking thing. So all the strength gauntlets are now called mitts. All the strength ones are the ones that are called gauntlets. So every strength gauntlet will have this like real chunky vibe that just separates itself. You're not gonna like feel like it looks like 
it could blend across three different classes. So I think we just get more variety of, of just gear this way. Um, I think helmets is the best example of, of the gradient I keep talking about, where dex is where I've got hoods, but you'll notice that dex int, there's a hood, strength dex, there's a hood, but the defining feature of that is that it's a helmet. And the defining feature of that one is that there's a little COVID mask in there. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so I've talked about base types for a bit. So um, now I'm going to go over the difference between base types and uniques in PoE2 from an art perspective. Um, it's something most people, I guess, don't think about. But which we're trying to light, like treat the base type items with very clear, distinct lighting. But it still has, it still is stylistic. It's not just this flat like. I just threw it in the renderer and hit render type thing. Like we have placed lights and we've tried to make it look as cool as it can. It's very, it's very clear and subtle. There's a bit of warm lighting, a little bit of cool. That's about it. And the uniques don't really have any rules. We just, we just sort of make them look as bold and colorful and interesting as possible. Um, and the other thing is, every base type in PoE2 will have a unique associated with it at launch. Mm -hmm. Every single one of them. And every single base type has unique art in and of itself. There's no base type that repeats. You will not get a shield later that has the same name, uh, has a different name and the same art. Every single act has entirely unique art all the way through the game. So to me, the unique having a bit of a bond with the base type that it comes from is kind of important um, because otherwise it kind of ruins the item identity of, of both. If you had like a unique saw that was like a scimitar looking curvy thing, but the base type was just a straight blade, it's kind of like, shouldn't that be with the base type that has a curvy blade? <laughs> it's like kind of common sense to me. So the shield in the middle is a pretty good example. They're very similar structurally, but very different in terms of what actually happens. Um, this one being super Celtic and really ancient bronze looking and We'll do something very cool with the numbers, I imagine. <laughs> uh, this little shield I like a lot. This little buckler with a spooky man trapped in there. Um, this is an example of, of the lighting of these things. So this is actually unique armor that they don't know about. Um, doesn't do anything yet. That's, that's lit how we would do a base type. And then here I remove it all and I try to give it some more character make it look a little bit more moody and a little bit more special. Um, and we do this for all the items. We, we hand place and we, we pose the meshes and we try and get a really iconic little look to it. So that's the difference between those two things. Um, and here I might get Jirishi to sort of pitch me back in because this is going over the act specific rundown of gear. So in each act, you will find a gear specifically for that act. So all the base types will look like they're very Marraketh in Act 2. And as soon as you get to Act 3, they're going to look very vile. And you purchase them yep. just from the vendors? Yeah, so the vendors of each act only sell gear that comes from that particular act. Mm -hmm. They don't sell, like, you don't go to Act 2 and you can't buy Act 1 gear. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and you just get more distinct looks. Um, I personally really wanted that gigantic stone Aztec shield <laughs> and people were worried it was too big and I said it might not be big enough <laughs> for me. I wanted it this thick. Anyway, um, so this sort of getting into the art focus of items in terms of um, some tropes that happen with fantasy art in games quite a lot that kind of bug me. All that stuff is obviously AI uh, crap. Um, but, I mean, you know, it looks cool. When I was 13, I would be like, hell yeah, it's got spikes all over it. <laughs> but um, after a while, you, you've seen these. They're in, every game. They're in everything. There's so many games that have that, and just loads of it. And you can infinitely produce, I mean, AI just did four of them like in half a second. Um, whereas this stuff is from our world, 
and it goes back centuries and there's just a rich history and culture behind all this art making and weaponsmithing from like uh, just, just different metal, metal making practices in all these different countries, India and like old cultures like the Scythians and the Mongols and how it all blends in and I think artists need to do more to really learn from the past to make more interesting looking stuff. Um, this is what I want Wee 2's items to feel more like, more like these really rich, dense things that have all this history behind them. Um, we do a lot of investigation on the, on the environment side with stuff, like early on there was talks of like how the Marrakech would write musical notation and how that would affect <laughs> sculptures on the walls and like the environment art and then trying to get that into like the item designs and stuff as well. A lot of thought goes on there to like get things to have a real rich sense of culture because for a game that's all about items, you don't want everything to just look like a jagged spiky sword every single time or like just cool flaming blade of blah. <laughs> you just want, like there's a place for them, but having just like a spoon, it's just a weird spoon and that's the unique is kind of cool to me. There, there will be a spoon. <laughs> <laughs> what is it gonna do? You figure that out. <laughs> um, so this is, the, this is the part I really like, is that I'm, I, I personally make a lot of weapons and, and items and stuff. But the cool thing is I make all these unique items. Oh, this is a drop, by the way. This is nothing. They, they, if I could have a screen that went all around the whole building, it still wouldn't get them all. They'd keep mm -hmm. going. There's many. Anyway, they don't know about them most of the time. I'm just making them. And then I sort, of, I sort of give it to them. And to me, it's kind of like they've, found a, they've actually found a unique and it, they don't know what it does. Like it's actually <laughs> unidentified. And th they have to be their own little decad cane and be like, what the hell does this do? <laughs> Which is really exciting to me. Like, like uh, I don't know, this little weird wand up the top that is basically a hand holding a bell. I, don't know, I just wanted a hand. You hold a hand that holds a bell. <laughs> And so I just think, well, there's cool stuff there. Does it like reverberate your spells? Does it bounce things back? I don't know. <laughs> it does stuff. It'll be cool, I promise. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I have bad hearing, I didn't hear that. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, that was just a little tease of stuff. I just wanted to, to sh show you that um, the items from Pee Wee 2 are going to be very rich and um, every unique is going to have a lot of interest and, and just flair and, and just feel like it came from somewhere. It wasn't just like always just, uh, it looks cool. Like some of them are just, they look cool, but a lot of them are going to be really well thought out. Um, from the art side, I don't know about the numbers. So <laughs> this is where I pass over to this guy. And uh, thank you. Okay. Hey, so uh, let's talk about item mechanics then. So my name is Rishi. I'm a game designer at uh, Grinding Gear Games. I mostly work on item stuff. I've been working on them for a really long time, although, of course, I do other stuff as well. Um, so it is no secret that, we've, that we think items are very important to this game. Like, we just spent you know, all this time talking about just what they look like. And there's so much more to them, right? Like, we want items to feel real. They're more than just a collection of stats. Uh, and now that PoE2 is a game in itself, we have a chance to look at items all the way at, at its very fundamentals and try to make some changes that we couldn't make in an existing game because of uh, the worry of how you would port existing items over to a new system. Um, so I'd like to go over some of these fundamental changes with you. Uh, so this is the first problem that we really wanted to tackle. Um, in Path of Exile 1, different weapon classes don't necessarily feel that different from each other. Like, like, like just take an axe and take a sword. There are some light stat differences. You know, some of them have you know, faster swing speeds or faster damage per hit. Uh, but how, like how much does that difference actually matter? So for this reason, we added implicits to all the weapons. So you know, every sword has an accuracy-related implicit in most cases. 
axes don't have implicits, maces have stun-related implicits, and so on. And it helps, it gives them a bit of identity, but it doesn't really make them feel that different, right? Like, they, you're still just swinging a bunch of stats. Uh, the other problem, too, is that most skills you can use with kind of any weapon, so you're, what you really care about is, at the end of the day, which, which is the weapon that's going to get, uh, do the most damage, and I'm going to use that weapon. So, I want to talk about the attribute, uh, uh, like, like attribute alignments in this game. And we consider this very important as a way of aligning certain uh, attributes with different uh, mechanics in the game. There are some new weapons in there. I'll let you look to see what they are. Um, but effectively, what we do is we associate different weapons with different attributes. And that sort of gives us a, uh, like, so, like some guidance on what their stats will be. Um, for example, armor-related stats are usually aligned to strength in our game. Of evasion is aligned to dexterity. Energy shield is aligned to intelligence. And damage is no different, right? Uh, Strength-aligned weapons generally have higher uh, damage per individual hit. Dex-aligned weapons are usually faster when it comes to their swing speeds. And interline weapons are usually really good at dealing critical strikes. So, you know, using this as a, as a baseline, it's, it's, it's kind of clear that, you know, a mace is going to have higher damage per individual hit, whereas a claw is going to be faster and, you know, a dagger is going to have more crit and so on. Um, so, we have tried to emphasize these differences really heavily in Path of Exile 2. So, I just have, you know, a random dagger from the, from the dagger base types picked up and a random axe. And you can see the difference in critical strike chances is much higher than what you might be used to. So a dagger is going to start with 15%, and then you have mods that improve it over and above that. So when you're using a dagger, you're really going to feel like you're, like you're critting a lot. Whereas an axe, you can see the, the base damage of the weapon is going to be, you know, uh, uh, like per hit is going to be quite a bit higher. But all this too, like this is going to change like how you view weapons, but it's still not entirely enough as well. Because Ultimately, the difference between a mace and an axe, for example, is the sort of attacks you can do with it. So, we have, uh, so in Path of Exile 2, most attacks are going to be usable with a single weapon. So this immediately makes designing new attacks a lot more interesting because you're not thinking, what's a cool attack? You're thinking, what is a cool thing that an axe in particular can do? So let's talk about axes. So, axes, as you can see from the, uh, from, the, from the chart, they will be slightly faster than maces. They do slightly less damage per individual hit than a mace, but they're still primarily strength aligned, so they're going to do a lot of damage per hit. But on top of this, what defines an axe thematically are themes such as uh, culling and executes. And in Path of Exile 2, you can throw them. So that leads, to a lot, uh, that leads to really interesting skill design, because you can throw them, wait for them to return. You know, it's almost like a boomerang. Daggers. So daggers are sort of 50% in the int section, 50% in the deck section. So they're both high crit and, high, uh, and, and, and have decent swing speed. But obviously, per hit, their damage will be, slow, but will be lower. Thematically, what do you think of when you think of a dagger? They're mostly all about fast attacks, uh, trying to find the weak spot of enemies, which sort of perfectly matches what they are in this, uh, in this chart. Um, and they're also thematically linked to poison, which will really come out in the skill design for daggers. So when you have this identity of item class sorted in this way, you don't need to have an implicit that is on every single weapon of that type. So we've removed them. Uh, all swords do not have you know, an accuracy implicit. All daggers don't have you know, a crit implicit and whatever. So now that the implicit slot is empty, we can make interesting implicits that sort of make certain bases throughout the game feel very different to each other. Because it's not really, it's not super interesting if you're just going up a ladder of slightly stronger and stronger bases. We want to throw something in there to, to make the upgrades not feel too, too monotonous. So we've added some wacky implicits, and I'd like to show you some of them. So this is an axe. Uh, you'll find it at a, a certain level. And you might notice that this deals no physical damage whatsoever. It, its base damage is just pure fire. So this is going to give you some interesting considerations when you find it. Like, how are you going to build for it, especially if the axe before and the axe after is mostly physical? 
So it's not just that it's a damage upgrade from the previous axe. There, there, are, there are these other interesting considerations to think about as you go through. Here's another one. Yeah, so this is a mace that destroys enemies that you kill with critical strikes. Now, it's, it sounds pretty useful, right? That, uh, you know, because who doesn't want cops removal on their weapon? But note that this is a mace. Maces are not necessarily that good at dealing critical strikes. They, uh, so, it, so, you know, it, it could be useful, but how do you make it useful? It's not interline, so it's going to have low crit. There will be mods that can, increase it, that can increase its crit, but still, the way you built for it is supposed to really make you think. It's not that it's necessarily immediately useful. It's cool to have these sort of thematic things throughout the game, and it's just a puzzle piece that is there, you know? So that sometime in the future, someone might find something that, that they can do with this, that only this would allow you to do. If some of you have played the demo, and have played the warrior class, you might have noticed that they have a mechanic that breaks enemy armor. It's primarily a mace mechanic, but there is a dagger that does it here. Uh, it, uh, like, the mace skills are normally the ones that interact with this in a number of ways, but, I mean, a dagger does it. Breaking armor is obviously useful, and that makes this very special in build defining. But how are you going to best make use of something like this? Oh, well, that's an exercise left to the left to the user. I'm sure there'll be a million different broken things that'll come out of all of this. So, I've spent a bunch of time talking about attack weapons, so, let's, so let me briefly touch on caster weapons. So, in PoE 1, they were quite strange, right? Like you had a, like you had a staff, and they had attack mods, and they had attack attributes, and they could roll attack mods, but you're a mage, you don't want to hit people with the staff, you want to cast your spells. And as a result, their mod pools are a lot worse because you have both attack mods and spellcaster mods rolling. Like, of course, they did improve your spellcaster mods, but because there were all these mods rolling on the same item, it was really hard to get a good one. Um, we tried a bunch of Band-Aid fixes over the years. Like, I'm sure you're well aware of us introducing rune daggers and splitting staves into regular staves and war staves, but they didn't really fix the underlying issue. So we feel it's better to break out these concepts entirely. So, in PoE 2, uh, wands and staves will have no attack stats whatsoever. They just come with a skill that costs no mana. Um, these spells can be a number of things from just a straight up damage spell like this one, which is the first uh, staff you get as you wash up on the beach, or a number of other things that can be used alongside your other skills. Um, the later ones obviously tend to have a, a few more interesting considerations. Like this one obviously will be very uh, familiar with anyone who's played PoE, where this lets you triple cast your next skill, uh, which is obviously really good for skills with really long cast times. Um, here's, a, here's an example of... Pretty fun, right? Uh, so you might be wondering, what about people that want to hit people with staves? So we have split out the melee portion of staves into its own weapon class called a quarterstaff, and it's sort of thematically linked to the monk. But again, this is Path of Exile. Anyone can use any weapon and, and do anything. All the mods here are obviously attack-related mods, and here is a particularly interesting one, which has a longer range than every other quarterstaff, and you can actually see its art looking longer than the others in-game if you compare uh, two quarterstaffs together. So, uh, we've talked about the two, I would say, core archetypes that we sort of uh, support in Path of Exile 1 with attackers and spellcasters, but trappers and miners, of course, are, are another archetype that sort of got left in the dust a little bit in, in Path of Exile 1. Like, they were fully supported with a bunch of skills and everything, but they didn't really have gear that was specifically designed for them. They just sort of used, you know, caster weapons because you know, it, it, it increased the damage of their skills. But it's really thematically weird, because they're not a mage. They're supposed to be mechanically aligned and, and that sort of thing. So we wanted to add an item type that can be used specifically with trappers. So the first major change is traps are no longer spells. Traps are just trap damage. And they will be ways to improve specifically trap damage that are not related to spells. So, this is an example of the new base type that you can use in your main hand. It takes both your hands, and you can see that the, tr the throw time of the trap is listed on the, on, on the item itself. And yes, that means you can modify it further with mods on the item. Um, the other thing you might notice is that uh, it has a detonation type. Uh, 
That is because we have sort of combined the concept of trappers and miners into one thing. Mines are also trap skills, but with a different detonation type. So any, you can take any trap skill, swap your weapon that you're using, and it's now a mine. It's not that you have to uh, specifically find a mine skill to use, uh, you know, to, to actually have that play style. And the other interesting thing is, uh, with the new weapon swapping system, you can have a trap in your alternate weapon set, so you can still use other skills, but still trap occasionally if you really want to as well. Uh, yeah, I do have an example of a mine as well. So this one, as you can see, will have the detonation type, which is manual, which requires you to detonate them afterwards. And yes, just like other weapons, there will be implicits uh, on some of these throughout the, throughout the progression, so you'll have these interesting considerations on trappers as well. Um, so, the other art type that, doesn't, that never had uh, you know, a specific item class dedicated to it was minion builds and you know, general support type characters. Like, we've tried a bunch of you know, band-aid fixes over the years, like you know about the convoking wand, and we've added bone rings, and we've done a few of those things, but they don't really fix the root of the problem. They do help, but you know, what you really want is a set of items that you can find throughout the game that is specifically for you know, this particular class. Um, and we, as you know, we've added spirit as a concept, which is for our uh, skills that were previously reserving your mana, but it also is about your, your like, but your, uh, permanent minions also use your spirit. So if you want more zombies, there's no such thing as just getting plus zombies. It's just increasing your spirit gives you more zombies. You can use as much of, uh, as much of your spirit as you like to get as many zombies as you like. It is completely dependent on, on, on how much spirit you have. So we obviously wanted a base type to support this, and scepters are thematically perfect for this kind of thing, because they were also kind of weird with the whole half attack, half spellcaster type of thing. So I have some examples of uh, scepters here. Um, as you can see, uh, the mods almost always grant aura-like effects, or they imp improve the spirit on the item itself. So it's almost like you get to build your own aura and hold it in either your main hand or your off hand. You get to have that flexibility where, you know, if you're not planning on doing much attacking or spell casting yourself, then hold it in your main hand, have a shield, and you're pretty defensive, and you get to buff your allies or your minions, or, or well, your allies and your minions, I should say. But if you want to, let's say, do some attacking as well, then you can just hold it in your offhand if you like. And then you can still have a weapon in your main hand, you can do some damage, you know, for something like, uh, you know, a, a build that would be similar to Dominating Blow, you can still have a weapon, and you can still buff your minions in your offhand. Um, you can also put it in your alternate weapon set if you want to just buff your allies once in a while and not all the time, but just be careful not to use the extra spirit that you gain to use your minions, because when you swap out, your minions will go away. So we've talked a bit about uh, skills before, so, uh, as you, and as you might have seen in the keynote, um, we had a big problem with how skill gems dropped in Path of Exile 1, because the more skill gems we add, the less chance you have of finding the one that you particularly want. And because to solve this problem, we added gem vendors in Path of Exile 1 so you could get one at any time that you like. But that isn't also the correct solution because what that means is it's just trivial to get any gem at any time. And at that point, why are they even itemized? Like you should just have access to your skills, right? So in Path of Exile 2, we wanted to both have the fun moment where you find a gem of like a higher tier, but also we wanted to not prevent you from just using a skill that you want to use at that, at that particular time. So we've added uncut gems. So regular skill gems no longer drop, and you just find uncut gems of a certain tier, and you can use them to turn them into any skill of that particular tier, and they come pre-leveled. So what that means is, um, it's a lot easier to switch into a new skill because you don't have to then re-level that skill from level one and wait for, you know, uh, wait, for the, wait for the damage to come back to what the current skill it was that you were using. Like, you can just seamlessly swap from one to the other. What this means is certain gems just don't exist at lower levels. For example, I think Firestorm is a 28 skill in Path of Exile 1. So in this, uh, so here, you might, find, you, you might get Firestorm at level 5, and levels below level 5 just don't exist. So, uh, this is, uh, so let's get into the meat of the matter, which is item drops. Um, as you all know, we want item drops on the ground to matter more. You generally don't pick up rares on the ground because you know if you're going to pick them up, Nine times out of ten, they're probably going to suck, right? Like, they're not, like you're not going to use them. Uh, 
there are a number of reasons for this, and we are trying to address a lot of these reasons uh, when, we're, when we're redoing item drops from the ground up in, in, in PoE2. But there is one particular reason that I wanted to talk about, and that is actually because of how the chaos ob functions. So if I pick up, let's say, a helmet of item level 70 and another helmet of item level 70, and I use a chaos ob on both of them, it doesn't matter what you picked them up. It, 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 like, it doesn't matter what item it was that you picked up originally, because they're now completely new items. The only thing that mattered is the item level of the item that it started with, in both cases. The mods that they came with just no longer matter anymore. So every base type is effectively the same, just as good as every other base type for the purposes of, you know, for, for the purposes of a chaos orb anyway. So picking up a rare at that point is identical to using a single chaos orb off, on that same base type. So we're making a change to how chaos orb works in Path of Exile 2. So rather than rerolling the item entirely, it replaces one mod on the item, just one. So this means the item that you start with matters a whole lot more when it comes to this. Because you pick up a rare, it has you know, two to three great mods, maybe one or two really bad mods. Those rares previously were not going to be useful because it didn't matter that it had a few good mods because it also had those bad mods that sort of made the item not worth, uh, not worth using. But now what you can do is you can just, you know, like every item could be one or two chaos orbs away from becoming a really great item. Whereas previously those, those rares were still not good because they didn't have those good mods. And now, you will, and now I, I, you will hopefully use your chaos orbs for a lot of these sort of near miss rares. Just use one, and if it, if it doesn't work out, well, the item wasn't that, wasn't that fantastic to begin with anyway, because it still had those bad mods. But if, if one of those bad mods turns into a good one, then that would be fantastic, and, 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 and that would really improve this, uh, this feeling of the items in the ground mattering more, because what you started with now is of paramount importance. But if this was the only change, then the best way to make items would be to you know, start from a magic item, spam your alterations, how many ever thousands it would take, and then regal, and then do that. So for that reason, we are making a few changes. But the first one is that we, uh, alteration orbs will no longer exist in Path of Exile 2. So the way to do this is you must start with a good magic item or a good rare item, or you can create one with a transmute or a chaos orb. Now, to help all these changes, we have gone through every single uh, item and looked at their mod pool and made changes to every single uh, item's mod pool. So almost everything will be different to help you with this, uh, with this process of making item drops matter more. So to quickly wind up, I want to touch on unique items. Oh, oh there we go. Uh, our philosophy on unique items is that they must be the best item for somebody. But most unique should not be the best item for everybody. Now, I obvious, now, we obviously feel like unique items are very important to us. And as Dane mentioned, we want to have a unique item on every single base type. Some of you may not know this, but before I started working at GGG, I, was, uh, I designed one of the supporter uniques way back in the day. So I have, I have, had, I have had massive love for, uh, for the unique items of this game. The, the support unique that I made back in 2013 was Cloak of Defiance, which resulted in the Mind of a Matter Keystone. Um, and I've been involved in making unique items ever since Breach, which is 2016. So it's been, it's been quite a while. Um, so we want to make many unique items for everybody. Uh, they, they are meant to enable wacky things. They're meant to let you do things that you thought would never be possible and possibly be build-defining. So I have an example of a low-level unique that we made. I wish we had more to show you, but uh, this one here is, is, is pretty interesting in that it always freezes enemies for its full duration when you hit them the first time. So you always have a really strong initiation as soon as you walk up to an enemy. So uh, like, men, uh, like Dane mentioned, every base type will have a unique, and that, in, and that includes a lot of new uniques. But don't worry. What this also means is we are going to be bringing a lot of your favorites from Path of Exile 1 into Path of Exile 2. Because is it really a, is it really a Path of Exile game if you don't have a Headhunter or a Shavs in it? Yeah, exactly. So uh, they, they might be slightly different to what you might, uh, you might be used to. You know, a few stats might be different here and there as a result of the mechanics changing. 
but they will be instantly recognizable as a result. And you'll have a lot of your favorites that you used to, uh, that you, that you, that you used to like playing with in Path of Exile 1, and you will have a lot of new ones as well to find as, as you go through. So I think that's everything from my end. Uh, I guess we have some time for questions. Mm -hmm. Come on, Zaki. I'm a game designer for GGG, and I will be doing the questions here. And while I wait for people to submit some questions, I will ask one I prepared earlier, and that is, does the art of the item dictate the design, or do you design first and then get the art for the item? It can be very different depending on what is necessary at the time. Like, sometimes we just have to make a lot of uniques in a really short amount of, amount of time. And if we have art available, then we try to fit the stat to what the unique art is already there. But generally, sometimes it's, you know, we have this crazy idea that we're like, can we do this? And it's like, well, it sounds cool. Let's do it. And then we make an item, and it's just a blank item without a name, without any art. And then we try it in game. It's like, this unique is awesome. And then we make the art for it. So it can go both ways. I would say more often than not, at least in Path of Exile 1, it's been mechanics first into art, but, you know, that may not um, be... Yeah, and for PV2, it's, um, it's more the opposite for now, because um, for a long time, they didn't really know what they were doing with uh, items, and as, as basically a blacksmith that just smashes things out really quickly, <laughs> I was just like, that's a cool sword, that's a cool sword, that's a cool sword. I just make all this stuff, and um, yeah, they're, they're going to find that treasure trove of stuff and turn it into stuff. But um, I think it's really valuable to have art that can inspire gameplay stuff that they weren't even thinking of. They might not even have it never have entered their mental space. Oh yeah, that happens a lot, I would say. They'll just see it and go, oh, this thing's like split in two and it could be like, you know, hits the guy here, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay. um, so let's see what else we've got here. Uh, do you have any memorable uniques from Pee one that you have designed? Oh, that is a tough question, because I've made <laughs> so made many. Uh, I think one of my favorites, uh, or at least I would say very memorable, was Indigon. Because Indigon was probably the start of that entire set of uh, mana-related spells that, that followed later. But Indigon was really the first. It was the first item that weaponized mana into a form of damage. I have, a, I have a thing yeah. for that as well. Yeah, I was going to ask for the outside if you have any like of your favorite art um, pieces. For I've been units. doing pretty much most of the unique item art since I guess whenever Betrayal happened. I came I, I came on board a little. 2017? Maybe. Oh uh, wait. Maybe. Last five years, <laughs> something like that. And um, so I've done a lot of the art for them, and the art has a very different name to the final game. It's not even close. <laughs> it gets changed. Um, an interesting one to me is the shield everyone knows as the Squire. I think it's the thing with three white sockets. Yep. Um, yeah, I, I made them have three white sockets from yeah, an art perspective. I remember. Because I, I modeled three white sockets, eyeball things on it, and I was like, it's going to have three white sockets. Yeah, I, I actually remember this. And they were like, I, OK. Well, it was busted anyway, so adding the three white sockets, I don't know if it really changed too much. Yeah, so I just made more OP. <laughs> but, but on that same day, I made that. I just made it. And they were like, oh, we need another shield. And I was like, OK, I'll make a cooler one. So I made a cooler <laughs> shield, visually, and that ended up being the oppressor. <laughs> and I was very bummed about trash that. Trash to trash. Wasn't, definitely wasn't the cooler shield. If I knew, I would have not made it that cool looking. I would have dug some trash out of the unused folder. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see what else we've got here. Um, in terms of making art and, I guess, items for an act, how are you, like, getting inspired or taking inspiration um, from? We have really strong art direction people. Um, some come and go on. Um, shout out Chanda. Um, <laughs> Yeah, um, and they, they really just put a really dense fabric of, of, of thinking over all of the acts, like really going into Marrakech and Fahl and Karui and, and others I'm not going to talk about. Um, and just w basically we would work with them and establish like common shape language and like themes and stuff and, 
and just to just to make things feel cohesive and, and part of that world. Um, same kind of patterns and shapes and stuff like that. And um, yeah, it's the most interesting part I think because it, it sort of you create stuff no one's ever seen before, kind of because it's like it just doesn't. You know, there's like weapons made of like cactus wood. Like, no one makes weapons of cactus wood. <laughs> but they were like, oh, these people, they, they only have access to cactus wood. So the handle has to be cactus. I'm like, all right. I can't, I, I can't have just wood. Otherwise, it breaks the theme. It's like, well, where, 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 where'd they get that wood from? <laughs> it's like small stuff like that. Another question we have here. Uh, are there versions of the early game bases that have stats appropriate for, I guess, towards end game? Oh, yes. So... Um, those implicits that you will see throughout the campaign will be repeated in endgame, uh, in, in sort of endgame bases. So if you happen to like, you know, uh, something that, that an implicit enabled earlier on, you will be able to use it later on as well. Uh, Probably should have mentioned that earlier. <laughs> uh, I guess this is in reference to the chaos orbs. Is, uh, will ALK scouring still work? Uh, no, it won't, because... There will, no be, there will not be any scouring orbs. Yeah, they're gone. <laughs> if you want another item, you're going to have to elk a white one. <laughs> um, why is there no 75% int, 25% strength or dex weapon? So, like, why aren't you fitting more of the uh, pie into the ratio? You haven't seen all the weapons yet. <laughs> well, maybe. Um, there actually is a few, but it... It, it wouldn't have really you know, looked really nice in that graphic because um, some of the staves will have skills that are more uh, you know, strength interline spell, and then that would actually take up the 75% strength, uh, in 25% strength section of the tree. That is slightly more you know, nebulous, like in a little way, because the caster weapons don't actually have those base stats to you know, uh, change as a result of their attributes, but it's more just, I suppose, where, like, what attribute requirements the skills that are aligned to that particular class uh, requires. But again, this is Path of Exile. You're going to use an int weapon, a strength skill, and, and everything, you know? There's just a lot of questions. It's really <laughs> hard to filter through all of them. Oh, like, there's way more than I expected. <laughs> Uh, oh, this is good. Uh, does the art for items come from the story or the law? Or does the art sometimes influence the law? <laughs> I think that sometimes it kind of makes itself up as it goes. But it, it, there is there are times where, um, they, like, there is obviously characters and they have stuff. Like, there will be bosses and things that a unique weapon is just straight up like. Oh, like you get it off them kind of thing. There have definitely been times where we've made a unique with some story behind it, and then we've expanded on it at a much later date. Yeah. So it's always nice to have these sort of story threads that we can then follow up on later on. This could be interesting. Was there a memorable unique you tried to design that couldn't be implemented for a technical reason? Oh, yes, actually. Um, there are so many of these, but I think my favorite example is uh, so there's that helmet that drops from um, Kurgal, the boss in Delve, the, the lich from Delve called uh, Hail Negator, I think. So originally, this, the effect of what, uh, what that helmet was supposed to do was it was supposed to do what the agnostic keystone does, where it was supposed to drain your mana and heal your health. But for technical reasons that I don't actually remember now, it could not exist on an item that also had energy shield on it. And it couldn't exist unless it turned off your energy shield. So when we were doing the Legion Keystones, so uh, we had to come up with something completely different in the last week before uh, the, release of, uh, the release of Delve. But I, I always really loved that idea because it was just a really cool thing that, um, you know, it, it, and then when we were designing those millions of Keystones when we were doing the Legion uh, you know, like the Timeless Jewels, this idea just came back and I just kept pushing. I was like, you know, we got to find a way to do this because it'll be really awesome. And eventually, the, the way we were able to do it was, well, if you turn off ES entirely, then we can do it. 
So it sort of works as a downside, which, I mean, it probably did need one, at, the, at least at the time, but yeah. it also was a, was a technical reason why it needed to exist. Mm. And I guess as the last question before we run out of time here, are there item types with three, all three attribute split? Uh, not currently, no. I want them. Yeah? <laughs> for now. <laughs> for now. And with that, we have run out of time for this panel. So, all right. Uh, thank you very much. And <laughs> and uh, hope you enjoy the rest of uh, the, the rest of Exalcon. Anyone from Australia? Anyone from Australia?